Uh, yeah, so the uh, title of my talk is MSPaint.exe is not a good printer driver, which I think may be a bit of a confusing statement, uh, but we'll get that in less than five minutes, hopefully. Uh, so I work for uh, like a company called Upre. They do like temperature sensing stuff. Basically, they, they make some hardware as part of that. Uh, and a problem we have is that you, you have to print stuff. Uh, there's like small little labels on them uh, that you can see on the side here. They contain a unique identifying number and then a machine scannable one and then like a little bit of extra information. Uh, and and like you, you have to, to print this. There's no like way around it. Uh, but you have these like nice machines. You can buy some like brother P something. Uh, they let you send it some some graphics, and it puts it on like a little piece of text. They even have like some proprietary tools to like generate some stuff. But unfortunately, it's not like amazing. It like only runs on Windows. It's pretty limited. Uh, so it would be nice to like generate an image, and then you send it the image, and then it prints the image. Um, unfortunately, prints is a kind of bad. So uh, this is not trivial. If you if you try to send it, if you like open a Word document and print it, like obviously that's not going to work properly. It like has to squish it on like a long piece of tape. It doesn't even necessarily know like how long to make it. Uh, but even if you send it a a perfectly like pixel perfect image that is the exact width it can print and the like some exact length that is like, it is also capable of printing, it still like takes it and like squishes it down, puts margins around it, stretches the pixels, which like duplicates them and like gets rid of some. It's it's a mess. It, it looks bad. It's like unreadable. You waste half the paper. Um, so this is a bad idea. However, we have a solution, and the solution is MS Paint. Um, and and the reason this works is because as opposed to almost every other program or like every other program that the previous engineer who worked on this tested, MS Paint doesn't add margins. <laughs> so the you know, apparently this works. Uh, and then you write some code that looks like this. So you know, there's like a bunch of, of stuff. It's like you know, default Python. You get like some some libraries that help you with with Windows 32 stuff. Uh, and then there's this one line, MS Paint slash PC plus file name. This works. This worked for four years. Is <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, um, as as we all know, sometimes things update. And I mean, this update was really nice. They added layers to MS Paint, uh, so it's good for drawing. Unfortunately, they also changed the printing, so now it, it adds margins. Uh, but there's a solution for this. You could try to like virtualize it, like get the old version, all of that stuff. That was a mess. Uh, and I did say it worked for four years, but it, it worked, and then like sometimes the settings broke, and you just kind of had to fix it, and you didn't really know why. So it worked for four years, but you can also write your own drivers. Like it's uh, the the printer is just like a USB device. Uh, there's a library called iUSB, which you can use to find devices and attach to them from user line modes. So you don't even need like permissions and like root stuff. There's a little bit of permissions on, on Linux. Um, and the device is just, you can just send it bytes. And then under the hood, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's just like you are under, uh, or at least like equivalent. You, you send it bytes to send by back. Uh, you have to think a little bit about when you send stuff. And there's a documentation for the, the printer. There's also docs for iUSB, but for the printer, there's a documentation, uh, luckily. This isn't always the case. Uh, but this one describes in somewhat good detail what you're supposed to, to do to make it print stuff. And uh, when the documentation doesn't exist or isn't good enough, you can always just open Wireshark and just record the stuff it sends over USB to it. That's a pretty good method. Um, but yeah, it describes a little bit. You know, it's okay. Some of some of the the documentation is very obviously not written by by people who have like English as the first language. So they they refer to stuff like dots or pixels as uh, pins, I think, which I don't think is a standard term, but may, maybe it is. Um, and if you if you you know you can spend some time, you can write this as a uh, Rust like create uh, or just like some some function calls and some types. And then you, you get the ability to, to read in some uh, bits that represent like an image or just like a PNG. And then you can send data over it and it, and it prints it. Um, you know, is this a good idea? Would, would you want to actually do this, right? Like maybe you could, you could uh, get Windows to like actually work or you could find like some subset of the, the settings that works. But this way you get uh, like an assurance that unless the firmware changes on the driver, this is going to work. 
Uh, additionally, if you have it with all the like rust niceties, you can add logging, which is pretty useful because sometimes you know the people in, in production who actually do this, because I, I don't sit and uh, attach the, the labels, is going to break and they're going to tell you, oh, it didn't work, right? But then you have the logs that tell you like exactly what bytes you sent and what bytes you received, when that happened, and like what your program did as a consequence, which is super useful. Uh, additionally, you just plug into like HTTP. You just have like an HTTP server. You can send it images. It just prints it, which is super useful because you get to like not have to think about like drivers. You can put the whole thing on like a Linux machine that's in the corner, and it you know it just works. Um, yeah, that was my lightning talk. I hope that was roughly five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. So next one. How close is that? Just wait. Okay. <laughs> I'm not running Windows. <laughs> it, it's, it's the Windows Bliss background on Ubuntu. And sorry if any Arch users that I'm running Ubuntu. Um, but yeah, that's uh, actually a really good starting point. Uh, if you haven't seen the title of my talk, it's, uh, what is it? I have to remind myself. I only did this like, I had this idea like 45 minutes ago. So my slide deck is actually, I can it, I can uh, yes. Maybe I should actually duplicate the screen one second. Uh, put it into mirror mode. Uh -huh, there we go. The title of my talk is Rush Should Be More Like PHP. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the door's there if you want to leave now. <laughs> yeah. OK, so uh, I followed press release command for this, or at least I tried to. It's not finished. So who, who am I? Uh, my name's Peter DeVoy. I've been developing Rust for 18 months. This might explain my philosophy, I'm not sure. I, I want to make Rust more like PHP. And by the end of this talk, I hope you do as well. Uh, someone's raised their hand, or no? You're waving to a friend, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so, 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 so why, what, what, what am I talking about? Why would I want to make Rust more like PHP? Uh, my problem comes from documentation. I, I, like, I really like documentation, which I know is a bit weird. Um, but I've been developing a long time, like maybe arguably 20 years, like, you know, in my, uh, almost in my prepubescent years, I was writing uh, websites. I had my first dot .com when I was 14 or something, which is about 20 years ago now. So I've been reading a lot of documentation. That's my point. Argument from authority, I understand. But it's still an argument nonetheless. So what I'm thinking is I want to make it easier for people to contribute to documentation because in my Rust development journey, there's been occasions when I've come across uh, things which have been not documented as nicely as I'd like them to be documented. And I've put a note here that that's okay. There's, I'm not assigning any blame. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's wonderful that people are producing open source projects and putting code out there and as a maintainer of open source libraries, you have a lot of things to do, and it's not like everything can be perfect. I'm, I'm sure everyone here can appreciate that. So there's no blame here. I'm not saying that it's bad, that documentation's bad. I'm saying it's a fact of life that sometimes there is bad documentation. So the problem that I want, that I'm kind of identified here, I think, is that as developers, we can spend time solving a problem that other people have solved. And this might abstract into like many uh, scenarios, but particularly with documentation, it might just be simply that you know the documentation wasn't updated when a version was bumped, and maybe there's a breaking change or something like that. And then you know everybody who's using a library, which maybe it has, you know, hundred thousand downloads on uh, on crates, will um, will encounter the same problem when they've got to maintain the application. So I think we can potentially solve this by becoming more like PHP. And this is controversial, I know. Uh, I'm being a little bit provocative here on purpose. Um, but let's talk about why it happens. I think there's barriers to contribution when it's obviously for all open source projects, but particularly around documentation. Maybe there's doc guidelines, maybe there's pull request guidelines. 
And uh, you know, maybe if you notice a problem in documentation, the time when you notice that problem isn't the best time for you to be solving that problem. You know, maybe you're at work, maybe you're fixing you know, a bug, like maybe it's critical, maybe you're yeah, fighting a fire, maybe you're on a deadline, and you're like, I've got things to do right now, and like, as a, a good pro-social developer, I'd like to help and contribute to the documentation, but I, I really don't have the, uh, the, the time right now, I've got to fix this thing for my boss, you know, so I don't get fired. So how can we get around this problem? And here's how PHP comes in. Uh, forgive the lack of slides. <laughs> wrong wrong uh, tab. That's the last slide. This is an example of PHP function, explode. So none of, for those of you who didn't have the luxury of working with PHP, explode is like a uh, string split, you know? So uh, it's called explode, it splits a string. And this is just the first one I thought of. And you'll see that there's quite nice examples, actually, I'd say. Um, but what you have at the bottom is this section, user contributed notes. And here, it's kind of like an upvote, downvote type system. And wow, this is only one years old. That's scary. <laughs> I was expecting this to be seven years old. But yeah, um, yeah, and you can see someone said, like, oh, you know, an empty string will still result in one element in the output array. And then, you know, a bunch of people have found this useful. And I, that's, you could say that's like, you know, that's sold 23 people there, like uh, some amount of time, maybe it's five minutes, maybe it's 10 minutes, but for more serious problems or more serious oversights and documentation, you know, maybe you can spend like an hour digging through library code, trying to figure out why the thing you think should be working because the documentation says this one thing uh, isn't working, even though you're following the documentation. And then you realize, oh, when you look in the library code, oh, actually there's been a version bump and the documentation wasn't updated. So, you know, those 23 people, if you spend an hour looking, that would be 23 hours of dev time. So, I think it should be uh, interest of the industry, you know, the people holding money, that we should find ways to reduce barriers of participation for contributing documentation. And I think this user-contributed notes thing is kind of like a nice middle ground. It's like you don't need to go to the uh, GitHub repo and read guidelines and... Uh, you know, uh, read the pull off, you know, fill out the PR uh, template, et cetera, et cetera. You can just slap your comment on the page and maybe this opens up other problems like, you know, uh, code, of contact, code of conduct things and uh, liability things, et cetera, et cetera. I think these could be like ironed out. Um, I did try during lunch to hack something together. Like I say, it's been a very short amount of time since I, I, I had to do this. I actually used ChatGPT to, <laughs> to generate the code. Uh, let's see. This is going to be a failed demo. I'm warming you up up front uh, if I can find the tab. Was it Chrome? So I'm a bit of a browser hoarder. That's my work. Uh, it's not enough for me to hoard tabs. I also have to hoard browsers. Uh, oh, here we go. Like, got an example. Like I say, this will fail. And you know why it will fail? One of the reasons is because apparently Docs RS uh, steals keyboard focus. Uh, I say steals, it's not really stealing it because I wrote this as a browser extension. Uh, so it's, it's stealing it from something which is stealing it. But here, <laughs> this is horribly formatted. But yeah, if my name was Simon, oh, it actually worked. Okay, that's weird. Earlier when I typed S, it went to the search bar. I was hoping this would be a funny demo. Okay, it's, it seems to work here. I don't, oh, there we go. It's in this field. If you start the note of an S, it fails. But this was just a grease bucket plugin. I just did it as like a proof of concept. Something like this could exist potentially on DocsRS. Maybe we can make it happen. Uh, I like working with other people. I'm not very good at uh, working alone and motivating myself for these things. Uh, but I think it's super simple. It could potentially save many, many hours of many, uh, many headaches potentially of us as developers to have something like this. Like I say, it's controversial. Maybe DocsRS team, maybe you're sitting here, maybe you don't want something like this on DocsRS, and maybe for good reasons. But maybe for that reason, it could be a browser extension, I don't know. Uh, if you think it's a good idea, uh, here's my uh, contacts. If you want to work on it together, you can message me. Uh, if you're a package maintainer, you want to send me hate mail because uh, <laughs> this is unfinished. <laughs> if you want to send me hate mail because uh, I'm stealing uh, contributors from you, that's fine too. Uh, I accept my fate. So there we go, that's that. I think I have a QR code to make it easier to contact me. Oh no, I don't. Like I say, I was repairing this during the last talk. You can scan this and write me on Telegram if you want. <laughs> yeah.